ever walked into one of those, you know, older buildings. Aww. And you get like a shiver down your spine. Not talking ghosts or anything. More like, you know, that feeling when you think about what might be hiding in the walls. Ah, uh, you're talking about asbestos, right? Not the most... Uh cheerful topic I'll grant you, mm. but definitely something anyone who owns, manages, or even just spends time in buildings built, say, before the 2000s should probably have on their radar. Okay, so let's unpack this a bit. I know asbestos is bad news, but why are we still talking about it so much? I mean, it's been banned in construction for decades, hasn't it? See, that's the thing about asbestos. It's a bit of a silent threat. It's not like it announces itself, you know, no bad smell. It doesn't really look like anything special. But, and this is a big but, once it's disturbed, those microscopic fibers it's made of, those become a major health hazard. And we're talking serious stuff here, asbestosis, even mesothelioma. That's a type of cancer linked directly to asbestos, isn't it? Unfortunately, yes. And the really sneaky part is those fibers are way too small to see without a microscope. Makes them, well, even more insidious. So these asbestos surveys everyone's talking about, they're not just about figuring out if asbestos is there, are they? They tell you where it is, what kind of shape it's in, what to do about it. Right. Bang on. And let's not forget the legal side of things either. In the UK, we've got the Control of Asbestos Regulations 2012, C-A-R-12 for short, and it makes it very clear. Dealing with asbestos isn't optional. It lays down the law for anyone who owns or manages a building that might have asbestos in it. Responsibilities, you know. Makes sense. Yeah. Before we get into the nitty gritty of these surveys, though, let's take a step back. Yeah. What exactly are we dealing with when we say asbestos? Sounds like something straight out of, like, a sci-fi movie. Haha. <laughs> well, in reality, it's a group of minerals found naturally. And for over a century, asbestos was the building material. Strong, fire-resistant, great insulator, you name it. You could find the stuff in everything. Floor tiles, insulation, even cement and roofing material. Wow, so it's everywhere. What makes it so dangerous, though? Is it like a poison you absorb through your skin? It's not so much about skin contact. It's more about breathing it in. Remember those tiny, practically invisible fibers we talked about? When asbestos-containing materials get damaged, or if they're disturbed, those fibers can become airborne. So, like, say you're renovating an old house, and you start tearing down walls or ripping up the flooring. Bingo. And if you breathe those fibers in, well, they can get lodged deep in your lungs, and that's where the trouble really starts. What makes it even scarier is there's no such thing as a safe level of exposure to asbestos. Even a tiny amount can have serious long-term consequences for your health. That's, uh, that's pretty sobering. So it's not just about, you know, avoiding touching stuff that might have asbestos. It's about making sure those fibers don't get into the air in the first place. Exactly. And that's where understanding the different types of asbestos and the kind of risks they each pose becomes super important. Did you know asbestos actually comes in different forms? Each one with its own level of risk. Yeah, I've heard people talking about blue, brown, and white asbestos. Is that what you mean? Right on the money. Knowing the difference is crucial because they're not all created equal, so to speak. Blue asbestos, or chrysidolite, to use it the proper name, is considered the most dangerous. It's got these very thin, needle-like fibers that, unfortunately, can really get deep into your lungs. But you can't just lump all asbestos together. You need to know what type you've got, where it is, and what condition it's in. That's the only way to make smart decisions about managing the risk, right? 100%. Just knowing you've got asbestos isn't enough, not by a long shot. And that's where these asbestos surveys really come in. They're the essential first step, the foundation for navigating the whole asbestos management thing, which, let's be honest, can get pretty complicated. This is definitely starting to sound like something you need a professional for, someone who really knows what they're looking for. You're telling me. But we'll dive into that fascinating world, the ins and outs of asbestos surveys, right after this quick break. And we're back, ready to dive headfirst into the world of asbestos surveys, Fred. Absolutely. Because as we were saying before the break, identifying this hidden threat, especially in these, you know, older buildings, it's crucial. It's like, ugh. It's like getting a health check for your building, isn't it? But instead of pre-existing conditions, we're looking for these potentially dangerous materials. That's a great way to put it. And speaking of dangerous, we've already established that not all asbestos is created equal. But what about the surveys themselves? How do you know which one you need? Is it like a one-size-fits-all kind of deal? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm assuming it's not, right? You assume correctly. It's more like, you know, choosing the right tool for the job. In the UK, we've mainly got two types. Mm. 
management surveys, and then there's refurbishment or demolition surveys. Each one has a very specific purpose. Okay, so walk me through it. When would you go for a management survey? Think of a management survey as a routine checkup. Like, if your building was a person, this would be their annual physical. It's actually a legal requirement here in the UK. Any non-domestic building offices, shops, factories built before the year 2000, they need one of these. Mm. So it's all about getting a baseline understanding, like where's the asbestos, what condition is it in, just to make sure anyone using the building day to day is safe. Exactly. It's about being proactive, managing any potential risks from asbestos during those normal everyday activities in the building. The surveyor, they'll identify any materials that might contain asbestos, check their condition, and then advise on any precautions you need to take for regular maintenance or minor work. Okay, makes sense. What about those refurbishment or demolition surveys? When do they come into play? Well, the name's a bit of a giveaway, really. Anytime you're planning some major renovations or if you're going to demolish a building, especially those built before 2000, you need one of these surveys. Imagine you're about to, I don't know, perform surgery on your house. You'd want a really good understanding of what's going on inside, right? Yeah, you're going way beyond a simple checkup at that point. More like a full body scan. Exactly. Refurbishment and demolition surveys. They're much more in depth, more intrusive. They really need to uncover any hidden asbestos because that's the stuff that could get disturbed during the work. And remember, disturbing asbestos, that's what releases those dangerous fibers into the air. Right. So with these surveys, we're talking about a deep dive, literally. But what does that actually look like? Picture this. You've got a team of qualified asbestos surveyors. They know their stuff. They've got all the right equipment. And they're going over a building with a fine tooth comb. Sounds kind of like a detective investigation, doesn't it? It kind of is. They're on the hunt for any trace of asbestos. Could be the obvious stuff. Pipe lagging, ceiling tiles. But it could also be hidden away in the walls, floors, even behind those textured ceilings we used to love. Bet they find asbestos in some pretty surprising places. Mm -hmm. So what happens when they find something that looks a bit dodgy? That's where the real detective work begins. They'll take samples very carefully of anything that might be asbestos, and they follow strict safety protocols because obviously we don't want to release any fibers. So it's not as easy as just pointing at something and going, yep, that's asbestos. Not a chance. To identify asbestos properly, you need to get those samples analyzed in a lab. And not just any lab, it has to be a UK's accredited lab. That means they meet the highest standards for asbestos testing. UK's accreditation, right, rings a bell. Can you remind us what that actually means? Basically, it's all about making sure the lab is competent and reliable. They have to comply with this thing called ISO 11020 for the surveying part that sets the standards for how surveys are done. And then for analysis, it's ISO 25, so the lab is definitely capable of identifying asbestos accurately. It's peace of mind for you, knowing the results are the real deal. So it's like a seal of approval from the asbestos authorities, basically. Okay, so the surveyors have done their thing. Samples are whisked away to the lab for analysis. <laughs> then what? What happens with all that information? Now that, my friend, is where things start to get really interesting. Because the survey report, that's just the beginning. What you do with that information, that's what makes all the difference. But we'll get into that crucial next step right after the break. And we're back for the final part of our asbestos deep dive. We've been on quite a journey, haven't we? From those spooky vibes in old buildings to the ins and outs of those all-important surveys. Absolutely. And remember those lab results we were talking about? Those are key. Because a Thank survey you. report, it's not just something you file away and forget about. It's more like, well... A roadmap. Right. It tells you what you need to do about any asbestos lurking in your building. Spot on. But you're right. You've got this roadmap now. What's next? What do you actually do with all that detailed information? The location of the asbestos, what type it is, what kind of condition it's in. Okay, yeah, good point. It's all very well knowing, but then you've got to act on it. Exactly. And that's where the asbestos register comes in. Think of it like uh, a specialized guidebook just for your building, all about the asbestos. It's where you put all the important findings from your survey. Every single bit of asbestos they found gets recorded. So no more guessing games, right? You know exactly what you're dealing with from that dodgy looking pipe lagging to those old textured ceilings we talked about. You've got it, but it's more than just a list, you see. This register, it's a living document. It's how you manage the risk of asbestos effectively. Because if you don't know where it is, you can't exactly manage it, can you? Now you're getting it. The asbestos register, that's the foundation of your whole asbestos management plan. And that plan, that's what tells you how you're going to deal with the asbestos in your building. Right. So let's talk strategy then. What kind of things would a good management plan include? 
Well, it all depends, really. You've got to look at what the survey says, what the overall risk is. Sometimes you get lucky. The asbestos is in good nick, tucked away somewhere it's not going to get disturbed. So in those cases, maybe the best thing is just to keep an eye on things. Exactly. You'd have regular inspections just to make sure nothing's changed. The asbestos hasn't been damaged or anything. You're minimizing the risk by, you know, being aware, being informed. Makes sense. But what about those situations where, let's say, the asbestos isn't in such a great place or it's not in great condition? Well, then you've got to be a bit more proactive. If there's a chance it could easily be disturbed, like in a high traffic area, or if it's already damaged, your plan might involve sealing it up and closing it somehow. Containing the threat, basically. Stopping those nasty fibers from getting into the air. Precisely. There are special paints and sealants you can use. They create a barrier over the asbestos. So you're minimizing the risk without actually having to remove the asbestos itself. Right. So we've got monitoring. We've got containment. What about those cases where, say, the asbestos is really badly damaged? Or it's just in a place where it's bound to be disturbed if you're doing renovations. Mm -hmm. Is removal the only option then? You're asking all the right questions. And yeah, sometimes removal is the only way, <laughs> but it's not something you want to tackle yourself. You know, asbestos removal, it's a whole big thing, very tightly controlled, and for good reason. This is where you call on the professionals, right? 100%. You need a licensed contractor, someone with experience who knows exactly what they're doing. They've got the right equipment. They know how to handle asbestos safely and how to dispose of it properly. Remember those stats we talked about earlier about asbestos-related illnesses? Well, this is how you prevent them, by making sure the job is done right, that everyone's safe. This has been honestly eye-opening, so much to think about. But if our listeners take away just one thing from this whole deep dive, what would you say it should be? Knowledge is power, my friend, especially when it comes to asbestos. Don't let the silent threat take you by surprise. Get informed, get those surveys done, and don't be afraid to be proactive about managing the risks. You'll be protecting yourself, you'll be protecting anyone else who uses the building, and you'll probably save yourself a lot of hassle and money in the long run. I'm going to put it better myself. And on that note, we've reached the end of our asbestos deep dive. Hopefully, you've all found it as fascinating and useful as we have. Remember, being aware of the issue is the first step. Don't be afraid to look for more information. There are tons of resources out there. And never be afraid to ask questions. Absolutely. We'll be back next time with another deep dive into a topic that matters. Until then, stay curious, deep divers.